I don't know if you know it, but God is still alive. Jesus is still present. The Holy Spirit is here with us to worship. Now, I also want you to know that the Bible says the devil is going to and fro. Yes, seeking whom he can devour. did you say bless or devour? devour Satan don't bless anybody he devours only if you let him so I just want to tell you we had a beautiful beautiful <laughs> service this morning this thing Hello. <laughs> we had a beautiful service this morning. God blessed. But the devil stirred the evening. Jonathan had to go to the ER with his back. Uh, his mother carried him. And I know in his mind he was saying, what am I going to do? But you know, there was a time in Jonathan's life when God put he and Samantha together. And one supports the other. So Jonathan did not have to worry. Samantha said, I'll do it. Amen. And she's here. But I'm going to ask her to come up, begin, before we have our opening prayer. And I'm going to ask anybody else that wants to come and stand in agreement. I'm going to anoint her to stand in for Jonathan and to anoint her to receive the power from God to stand right here and share just what God has told her to share. Amen. So anybody that wants to come in. Amen.
pray. Father, we have come into your house to worship you. And God, Satan, with all of his demons, can never stop our worship of you. So God, we're just asking you, God, to anoint this service, anoint every person in this house tonight with the promise that you made that if you come into my house to worship me, I will never refuse or leave you. I will always receive and bless you. So let it happen tonight. And we just want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That old Satan. <laughs> we don't worry about him, are we? Because Samantha just stepped right in. I mean, boy, Satan's mad right now. That's okay. Listen, soon and very soon, you know how I love that song. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Amen. Amen. Father, again, we just want to thank you. You have blessed us <coughs> in such a way that we can come with what you blessed us with, no matter how much treasure we come to give that portion back to you. And we just want to say thank you, God. You are all we need. Amen. And we pray it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Let us pray. Gracious and good, good Father God, we're just so thankful, God, for all the blessings you put into our life. And we're thankful for the opportunity to come back, God, and give back into your kingdom. God, I just ask that you take and multiply these tithes and offerings for thy kingdom and bless the giver as they had purposed in their heart. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. Jonathan mentioned this song this morning, this chorus this morning. And so, Jonathan, if you're watching... Well, this is for Jesus, but you love it too. Sunday, we will have the first, uh, I guess, preacher that has answered our pastor's search committee. He will be coming next Sunday morning and night. His name is Jonathan Smith. And I want you to be praying for him. Pray for us. This is a decision that the church has to make. But if we make it because we think it, it'll be the wrong decision. We got to make it 
because God thinks so. So I just want you to pray about it and come prepared next Sunday to answer what you feel. Um, <clears throat> also, next Sunday night, we will be having a nominating committee uh, nomination after the night service. So keep that in mind. We've got a bunch of positions to be filled. And here again, we don't fill them just because you're my <coughs> friend or I know you or I know you. We fill them because we prayed about it. And God says, that's who you need to choose. So rem remember that. And... <coughs> This morning, we took a, a love offering for Jonathan and Samantha. They're venturing into a new step in God's calling. It's the same calling, but they got to take longer steps. So be praying for them. We took up a love, love offering, and I'm going to give it to her, and she's going to share with Jonathan <laughs> when she buys groceries. And <laughs> but, but I just, I just want you to know how much they would appreciate and use it to glorify God in some way. And you can say, thank you, God, for giving me a chance to share to your kingdom. So, for Samantha, God bless you, girl. We're going to turn the service over to you. And we're just asking God to just give you strength. introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, my family has had an evening. And you know, Jonathan's not going to want me to share this, but uh, you know, in Revelations 12, it talks about how we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. So um, I'm going to share with you that Jonathan actually had this pain last night and he, he didn't sleep at all, like not one hour. Um, Thank God I could. <laughs> Might have been my snoring that kept him up, but I, I do think it was the pain. Um, and he just got up, and one of the first things he said to me this morning, he said, I think the Lord wants me to sing, which if you know him, he's terrified to sing in public. I love his voice. I think he should do it more. Um, but it wasn't, I haven't slept. I'm exhausted. It wasn't man, I'm in so much pain. The first words out of his mouth were, I think the Lord wants me to sing this morning. <laughs> and if you understood the amount of pain he was in, it was a difficult thing for him to walk to the car. Yeah. Um, and yet, if you saw him preach up here this morning, you had no idea. And that's not, um, 
necessarily he's so strong and powered through that's that's not what I'm saying what I what I'm trying to express to you is number one that the Lord will cover when you give him his yes um, and that number two I'm so thankful to serve under a man who's willing to give that yes despite all circumstances and he always says that I'm the engine that keeps the family going and if that is true then he's our compass that keeps us straight and so baby if you're watching I love you I honor you I pray that you're not I pray that you're sleeping um, but if you are, thank you for everything you do for our family. And I love that testimony because it goes right along with what I want to speak tonight. And if I had a title for today, it would be, is he not worthy of everything? And our family has experienced many circumstances in which we have to look at each other and say, it's no matter the cost. And you hear that in worship songs, you hear that, you know, people say that's almost become a vernacular in Christian Christianese, if you will, that it's almost lost its value and its meaning. But if you don't count the cost, when you're faced with that cost, are you willing to say, yes, Lord, you have everything? Because we've been faced with the cost a few times, and yet we're still able to say, yes, Lord, everything. You are worthy of absolutely everything. And so I want to challenge us with this tonight, and I want to preface this. Um, two things. This is not even in the sermon, but um, the first would be that Jonathan told me to speak in gentleness. <laughs> not because I'm bringing a hard word, but because between the two of us, he's much gentler than I am. So just know everything is spoken out of love. We are so, um, we've just fallen in love with, I mean, Jonathan loves this church since he grew up here, but I've fallen in love with this church and this body and the people here. Um, and you guys have welcomed me so well and my kids um and so just know everything's spoken with love even if it has no smile there's love <laughs> um and then the second thing i want to say is we are standing along with you and praying as you guys seek out this next um possibility of leadership um, and i want to encourage you with something that i feel like the lord has shown me in the last couple of months and it's this the only difference between david and saul which if you know their story saul was supposed to be anointed king, lost his anointing, and had a horrible end. David was anointed king, served as king, still had moral failures, but did not have the same ending as Saul. And the only difference is, is that when they went to, to do whatever task was set before him, David actually asked the Lord, is this what you wanted? Saul never did. Saul, with even the best of intentions, would build an altar and sacrifice to the Lord in hopes that he would then bless what he wanted to do. But he never actually asked the Lord, Lord, is this what you want me to do? And therefore, the Lord's not going to bless it because you didn't ask. David was blessed because he always asked the Lord, Lord, if you would, ha I want to go do this thing. If you will bless it, I will go do it. If you will not, then I won't. But he always asks the Lord. Um, we're going to get into that a little bit with Proverbs 3. But I just want to encourage you guys in that. Just ask the Lord and he will bless your way. He will make your path straight. He will make it clear. And he will give you the wisdom. There's no fear when you're under his covering. So I just want to encourage you guys with that as a body. And know that we are praying with you. We are excited for you guys. And we're believing for a fresh new beginning that will birth um, something powerful out of this body. So... Thank you guys for having us these last couple of weeks. It's been a blessing. And let me get into it. Um, so is he worthy? Um, Romans 12 tells us that we should present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. That would be a reasonable worship, meaning that's the least we could do, is offer our lives up as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Um, there's a song that I love and it, it, the bridge always goes, day and night, night and day, let incense arise. And people love to sing that song. And I always tell them, be careful. You're creating the incense. It is your body being burnt up on the altar that creates that beautiful aroma. So when you're praying, Lord, day and night, let the incense rise. You're praying that, Lord, let me be burnt up all day and all night. And sometimes what feels like hell is actually the refining fire. Sometimes what feels like hell is actually just being on the table and being submitted and surrendered to the Lord saying, this, if this is what it means to be a holy sacrifice, acceptable unto you, that's my reasonable worship, then Lord, I'm going to do that. And so what makes him worthy of being that? I'm going to start in Colossians 1. Um, we're going to start with verse 25. I know you're going to have the KJV up there. I'm like borderline dyslexic. I will struggle with that. So I'm going to read from my version right here. 
Um, so first, Colossians 1, 25 through 27, it says, I have become its servant according to God's administration that was given to me for you to make God's message fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what is the requirement in order to be a living sacrifice? Go and make his word known. That's what's required of you. So when you're asking, what is it, what is it to be a living sacrifice? Matthew 28 is not a suggestion. It's a commandment. <laughs> to go out, disciple, speak the gospel, preach the Holy Spirit. That is the commandment of the Lord. That is how you live your life as a living sacrifice, knowing that he is worth every cost. You know, people often seek purpose, and it's hard for me to hear because it's like your purpose is already written in Matthew 28. Go out, speak the word, <laughs> and in there you'll find how you can do it best, but that's your purpose on this earth. Go out, make the word fully known. And so, again, what makes him worthy of doing those things? What makes, who is Christ that living your life as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, on the altar, being burnt up day and night, going out and sharing his gospel and making his word known, who is he that that would make him worthy of doing all that? Well, again, further down in Colossians, we're going to go through 9 through 18, and this is going to be heavy in scripture, but it's a scripture that, that pierces the heart. So Colossians 1, starting in verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We're asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might and for all endurance and patience. With joy, giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in him. This is who he is. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him and for him and through him in heaven and on earth invisible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him he is before all things and by him all things consist he is the head of the body of the church he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything he is preeminent what makes him worthy? He died on the cross and that's it. If he never did another thing for me, you know, we're fundraising. And, and it took me a while to get here. And I think in the life that the Lord has called us to, we have to get to this place. Um, I would say that's true of, of everybody, but maybe he's expedited it for, for my family. Um, if he never gave us another dollar in fundraising, he's still worthy to be served. If we still have these bills looming over us and it's like, when, Lord, will we catch a break? He's still worthy to be served. If Jonathan's body never gets healed, he's still worthy to be served. We had a miscarriage last month. He's still worthy to be served. My first thought was, Lord, I give you all. And it's nothing about us being holy and righteous. It's just that he's worthy. I have no right to hold a moment of resentment or bitterness to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because I get to live forever in heaven. If that's all I get, Lord, have everything I have to give you on this earth. May we find that place on this earth. I think as churchgoers, it's very easy to compare ourselves to the world and say, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I pray, I go to church, I serve, I do. Our standard isn't the world. Our standard is Jesus. So to whom are we comparing ourselves? And are we meeting that standard? Because I can tell you as a full-time, sold-out missionary, don't have a home, given everything we have, I still don't meet the standard. Because standard is Christ. As laid out in, in Philippians chapter 2, and I don't meet that yet. I'm striving, and I'm serving, and I'm doing my best. But let us not sit in complacency because we look a little bit better than the person on our left or our right. Remember that they are not our standard. Christ is our standard. 
So again, let us look a little bit more into who it is that we serve. I think because of the work we do, meaning we go to church, we serve, we give, we tithe, we do the standard things, it's very easy to not see him rightly. It is very easy to grow too familiar with the gospel. So much so that he died for our sins no longer has value. Let us never grow too familiar with that phrase that the blood in which he shed would always bring us to tears that it would always stop us and make us freeze out of the weight of what he actually did for us and what he bore for us first colossians or i'm sorry colossians 1 we're going to continue on 19 through 22 for god was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything and everyone to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you as holy, faultless, and blameless before him. I think it's really easy to forget our testimony. I do make fun of Jonathan because I swear he was saved straight out of the womb. He still has a testimony and the Lord has still moved him. But mine's so much more glaring and I will never forget who I was before I met Jesus. I was a wretch. <laughs> but so was he. The one who has no worldly sins, he still was a wretch. Because he didn't meet the standard of holiness that the Lord has set. And I'm so thankful that Christ died so that I could be presented. And he did this when I did not know him, when I did not like him, when I hated him. He did this even then, when we were once alienated and enemies in our mind and by wicked works. And yet we're now reconciled by his flesh. And that we are presented as holy, blameless, and above reproach. Again, if he never did another thing for me, that's enough. That's enough to lay down everything I have in order to serve him with all that I have. I want to turn to Revelations real quick. You know, I think we, I, I, I don't want to diminish the work of the cross, absolutely. And, and he is the lamb of God, but let us not get anything twisted. He is no longer the lamb, but he is the lion and he is coming back, right? So let us not think that he's sitting there cowering as uh, Mr. Jimmy was talking about, as the lion roams to and fro. He is the lion. And I want to present to you the image that we should see him as now which is described in Revelations. So Revelation 1, 12 through 18. John said, I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a long robe with a gold sash around his chest. His head and hair were like wool, white as snow, snow and with his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze, and as it is fired in a furnace, his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand. A double-edged sword came out of his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at midday. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his hand on my right shoulder and said to me, don't be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death in Hades. Again, that should be the image of who we're serving, not the lamb. Praise God for the lamb. It is why we get to live and breathe today. But we don't serve the lamb. We serve the lion. We are coming with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is alive and well. We don't serve a dead king. If the tomb isn't empty, then what are we doing? And if the tomb is empty, then this is the image of Jesus whom we should serve. And if this doesn't get you fired up, man, if I was, I was an athlete in college, you know, you always listen to those songs that get you like pumped up right before you play. This would be like that for me. Anytime I got into any ministry, it's like reminding myself of who it is that I serve. Because this, if this doesn't get you hyped up to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I don't know what would. This image is crazy. Taking it one step further to Revelations 4. <clears throat> We're going to start at verse 2. 
And he said, immediately I was in the spirit and the throne was set there in heaven. One was seated on the throne and the one seated looked like jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow, a rainbow that looked like an emerald surrounded the throne. Around the throne were 24 other thrones and on those thrones sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with gold crowns around their heads. Flashes of lightnings and rumbles of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal, was also before the throne. Let me just say, this image is so wild, he doesn't even have the language to describe it. Something like crystal, something like jasper, something like glass, because I actually can't describe to you what I'm seeing. Four living creatures covered their eyes in the front and the back were in the middle and around the throne. The, living, the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. The fourth living creature was a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They covered their eyes and around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, and I've heard somebody say they never stopped screaming, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is coming. And they scream it because that's all you can do in the face of the Almighty. <laughs> that when you get in front of him, all they can do is just shout, Holy, 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 don't kill me. Holy, 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 Lord are you, Lord Almighty. That's all they could shout because he is that worthy. He is that overcoming. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne, worship the one who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, and they say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things, and because of your will, they exist and were created. I cannot be burdened to seek this man in prayer. This who is described, I, it cannot be a burden or an inconvenience for me to seek him in prayer. It says in the scriptures that you may boldly enter the throne room. That is the throne room. That scene, that would terrify me. And yet the Lord is saying, be, be welcomed. Boldly enter that scene and come before me and speak to me. He's not even like commanding it. He's asking it. I can't be bothered. I can't, I can't be too bothered, I'm sorry, to, to not do that. That that scene, he would, he would allow me to enter and say, I'm willing that you would interrupt that song to come speak to me. You would never enter that scene and say, Lord, I'm just too tired today. I can't do it. How many times have you gotten to church and said, oh, I just can't today. And I'm kidding myself included. There's been many a times I've been rebuked. <laughs> and it's like, the Lord puts me in that scene. And it's like, would you be too tired to be in that scene? If you saw me face to face, would you think I didn't get enough sleep last night? Would you think I've had too hard of a day? No way. <clears throat> Whatever you have is yours. May we see him rightly. May we not be so inconvenienced that we can't serve him with absolutely everything that we have. And I'm going to come back to that, the, the 24 elders and their crowns. <clears throat> if you don't view him correctly, then your motivation will be simply to do the work. Not necessarily to glorify him in everything. Now, for some of us who have been in the ministry for a while, it can get, oh, this is just the work. And I've, I've, just so you know, I've spoken this to missionaries who are full-time on the ground in remote places and said to them in their faces, you're not doing it to glorify him. You're doing it because it's the work. That's the wrong motive, right? And he will judge your motive. And I'll get to that in a minute. He, he is going to judge every single one of our motives. Why are we doing what we're doing? Is it to glorify him? Is it because he's simply worthy? Or is it because we want to, honestly, if we do it for the work, that's to glorify ourselves, isn't it? So we can check off our boxes. We must first count the cost, though. We have to take note of and measurement of what it is that we could be faced with. So when serving the Lord, count the cost. It could be your health. It could be your children. We've been faced with that. Could be your spouse. I'm currently being faced with that. And yet, does he have preeminence? 
as described in Colossians 1. Count that now. Is it your energy? Is it your time? We have a phrase in, in our ministry, and it's called the ministry of inconvenience. I have somewhere to be, and somebody stops me and asks me all these questions, and it's like, no, I got somewhere to be. If I would just stop and take a minute, the miracle could be that. May we not be so busy and consumed with our own agenda that we forget that the Lord is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and He can move in anything that He wants to move in. <clears throat> I'll quickly share a story of us in Brazil. Um, I think the year that this got uh, foundationally grounded into me was our first year in Brazil. I was pregnant with Elena. Asher was one. And we were doing all of this prep work for expeditions, which is um, Brazil's very logistically heavy um, country to run expeditions in. We're 20 hours down the river. You have to get the food down there. You have to find the boat. Like, it's, it's a logistical nightmare. However, we had found a way. We figured it out. And the day before our team lands, Jonathan, we, because we're so far away from where the team flies into, it's a 24-hour ferry ride just to get there. We have to leave the day before the team gets there to get there to then pick them up. That day, Asher woke up in the morning with, um, he, well, he had been up all night with 104 degree fever. And then that morning, he just wasn't getting better and it was getting worse and worse and worse. And we had to make the decision, like, who's going to go get the team? Like, one, it, we're the only leaders in the country. <laughs> one of us has to go. And so we didn't even bat an eye. And it's, again, this isn't, this is a testimony about Jesus. This has nothing to do with us. Because if you ask Jonathan on the boat ride if he felt as secure as we did when we made the decision, he would say no. <laughs> but we decided that I literally looked at him. He said, what are we going to do? I said, he's worthy of every cost. Go. Go do the mission that we have been placed here to be. I'm going to take him to the hospital. Go. And we'll figure it out. Jonathan, poor guy, had no service on this boat because it's a ferry ride 24 hours. We're in the middle of nowhere in the Amazon. And um, he's like, does my son have malaria? We didn't know what it, it could have been malaria. It could have been dengue. We didn't, we didn't know what it was. Um, and I took him to the hospital. Thank God healthcare is free in Brazil. Um, and we had our friend who is now one of our disciples, but at the time we just met him, Victor, um, who is a phenomenal translator. But again, we didn't know him. And he took me and, and Asher to the hospital and again, this boy has the worst time. They couldn't get his blood work. Took three grown men to hold him down because he's just so strong to get his blood work done. And finally, we got him sorted out. It ended up being just like um, a bacterial infection in his gut, which is, praise God, that's horrible so, but not malaria or dengue. <laughs> um, and, but the service was so bad on the boat, I would send him pictures. So he, sent a, he, he gets a picture of Asher in a hospital bed with an IV and then uh, getting tested, and then 10 minutes later, he's fine. <laughs> Poor guy was like freaking out. <laughs> um, but again, we're faced with that, oh, and he, he, he will tell this testimony, I didn't count the cost of Asher. He hadn't counted the cost of Asher when we said we would give him everything. So when you commit your life to the Lord, make sure you count everything, because when you're faced with it, you still got to say yes. Amen. Right? <clears throat> He is the name above every name, so search your heart and see, are there names in your life that you hold higher than his? Maybe mother, spouse, child. Search your heart. Are you willing to look at your spouse, my husband, who, as you guys all know, is the most anointed man I've ever met, and am I still ever to say, I serve the Lord and not you? <laughs> I stand by you, and, and you are the head of this household, but at the end of the day, I serve the Lord. Can I say that? Honestly, some days, yes. And some days are harder than others. <laughs> but we get there. <laughs> Which leads us to, when you're counting the cost, Proverbs 3. This is, um, again, another scripture that has, I think it might have been that same year, that foundationally just like transformed my life. It's very common. Um, it's one of those... It's like Jeremiah 29, 11. Like even atheists like know the scripture, right? But it's so rich in its wisdom. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. Acknowledge him 
in all your ways, and he will guide you on your right paths. Do not consider yourself to be, see, this is the thing, they ended at seven, keep going. Don't consider yourself to be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This will be healing for your body and strengthening for your bones. It says acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways. It doesn't say acknowledge him when you need him on a bad day. It doesn't say acknowledge him when you're on your high mountain and it's like praise God for all the blessings. No, it says acknowledge him in all of your ways. David acknowledged him in everything that he did. Lord, I want to go get this, this city over here. Can I get it? No? All right, then I'll wait. The one time he didn't, mess up real bad with Bathsheba and then the husband and it was a whole thing, right? Acknowledge him in all of your ways, in everything that you do and watch your life be blessed. Martha versus Mary. This is one of my least favorite comparisons of people because I am a Martha to my core. I will defend her in a minute. Um, the problem there is that you can't be so busy about the father's business that you forget to sit in front of the father. Don't forget to acknowledge him in all of your ways that he may make your path straight. It's the little acknowledgments that lead to big outcomes. Martha was right to do the things that were needing to be done. You do have to do the dishes when you're serving a lot of people. You do need to feed them, right? They weren't bad things that she wanted to do. But it was the posture of her heart and the lack of recognition of what was right in front of her that he might take preeminence over all other tasks. That's a hard one for us who are doers. Jonathan would say it this way in um, the story of the woman who breaks the alabaster jar and anoints Jesus. And everybody sits there and says, why would you? That could feed so many people. The problem wasn't that they didn't have the right posture of heart to do things that were good. The problem was that they looked at him as rabbi and she looked at them as him as Messiah. May we not grow too familiar with him that he's rabbi. May he always be Messiah. May he always be the Lion of Judah. Now I'm going to close by coming down to this, which is what is all of this for? We will be judged one day on what we do on this earth. And I'm not talking about, you know, the judgment seat where it's like, are you getting into heaven or not? If you are saved by grace through faith, you will get into heaven. There's no doubt about it. You could do no work for the Lord and... Well, that, that brings another question. But the point is that if you believe that Jesus Christ died and saved you, you are going to heaven. That's not what's that question here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If we want to turn there. Talks about how we are God's co co-workers, starting in verse 12. You are God's field, God's building. According to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it. But each one must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay another found, any other foundation than that which has been laid down. The foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on that foundation with gold, silver, or costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned up, it will be lost, but he will be saved. Yet it will be like an escape through fire. So again, we're going to be burnt up. Am I saying that you're going to be burnt up in hell? No, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that we will be tested. And what you place on that altar, again, we live our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord. We're supposed to live on the altar. At the end of our days, we will place everything we've done and put it on that altar, everything, whether intentional or not. <laughs> Every fight, everything will be placed on the altar, right? Is most of it wood or stray or, I'm sorry, or straw or hay? Or is most of it gold and silver and precious stones because we talk about that reward when we receive in heaven. And Lord, I am so thankful for that reward, but let me present it to you this way. Maybe that reward isn't what you think it is. 
I think oftentimes people think their reward will be the mansion. Or, can you guys still hear me? Okay. Um, I think people often think the reward will be the mansion or the jewels or the, you know, whatever. When we place our work on that altar and it gets burnt up, the gold and the silver and the jewels that is left, we get to fashion a crown out of that and praise God for that. My reward isn't the crown. That is every disciple that I have created. That is every person I have been able to bring into Jesus. That is every country that I have expanded for the kingdom of God placed on a crown on my head that then I get to take off and lay at the foot of Jesus. That's my reward. Just as described in Revelations 4, the elders' reward was that they got to take off their crowns and lay it at the foot of Jesus to say, this is your reward. It says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That joy was every crown that would lay at his feet because every crown represents every person that was able to be saved, discipled, raised up, every country taken. Lord, let that be our reward. So I want you to take stock today. May you recognize that though you might not have every need met on this earth, let me retract that. You will have all your needs met. Maybe you don't have everything you desire or want. Maybe things are harder than they could be. <clears throat> He's still worthy. Lord, I can't wait for the day I can lay my crown before you. And Lord, I pray it's beautiful. <laughs> Not for my glory, but for yours. And all the work I've done every ounce of ministry, if it's not done with the intention of glorifying him, it's wood. Even if from the world's eyes it looks beautiful, if my intention is for myself, it's straw. Let us not waste a moment on this earth. I want that crown to be as beautiful and ornate and large as it could possibly be so I can lay it at the foot of Jesus because he's worthy of that. And that is his reward. Amen? Amen. All right. Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. You are worthy of everything. <laughs> everything we have to offer, everything we could give, as insignificant as it might seem, as insufficient as it might seem. It is what we have to offer and it is what we will give. It is better to give something than nothing. Lord, I pray that the words spoken here today would pierce through the heart, through the spirit like bone and marrow. And Lord, may they be blessed with the recognition that you are worthy. May, may they have, may we all have a, a better understanding, a realignment of understanding who you are truly. And may we leave here invigorated to go forth and serve the Lion of Judah. We thank you for this house. Lord, we thank you for the people that are in it and the, the wonderful congregation that serves you. Lord, may they be blessed immensely. Lord, I pray for a freshness of, of breath and light in this place, in this house, in these people. Holy Spirit, would you have your way May we lay ourselves on the altar before you as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is our reasonable worship, and watch what you do with the incense that arises. Thank you, Lord. We praise you and we worship you. Amen. Thank you, guys.